We are over 90 episodes strong. Kiaya and I can't believe it. Join us every day at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another episode of Get Cozy. It's story time with Kiaya and Daniel. Hey, Kiaya, are you ready for Watson Wednesdays? Mm-hmm. Me too. Today on Let's Get Cozy with Because It's Story Time with Kiaya and Daniel, we're going to be sharing with you Chapter 8 of The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. The Ultra Glide. It's all starting now on Let's Get Cozy Because It's Story Time with Kiaya and Daniel. Hi, my name is Donnell Carter, certified personal trainer through National Academy of Sports Medicine and certified nutrition coach through Precision Nutrition. I'm here today to talk to you about online personal training, the future of personal training right on your phone. We start the week with an overview and progress reports. Following that, we have our calendar, day three, four, five different workouts. Further in depth, we see exactly what we're doing for the day. Find out more information, contact me. Stories are such an important part of our lives. Join my friend Kiaya and I for Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiaya and Daniel, where we share some of the greatest picture books and chapters from children's and young adult literature to inspire you to keep embedding literacy into your days. I don't know why we didn't catch on that something different was really going to happen this time. Mama and Dad started acting real strange right after they talked to Grandma Sands. First, Mama started writing in a notebook and adding things up and subtracting things. Then Dad and Joey and Rufus and me started driving all over Flint, buying things for the Brown Bomber. We stopped at Genesee Junkyard and bought a new antenna for the radio and four new used tires. Then we stopped at Mr. Biller's garage and had the tires put on the car. Then we stopped at the Yankee store and bought some spark plugs and some oil on antifreeze. Then we got got our next door neighbor, Mr. Johnson, to help put all that stuff in the car. Then we washed and waxed the brown bomber. When Byron walked by, walked by while we were working on it, he said, Y'all done real good. It still looks like a turd on wheels, but I gotta admit, Now it looks like a polished turd. We ignored him. While Joey cleaned the windows, me and Rufus washed the seats, even the parts that were torn and worn away. But the more we washed them, the worse they looked, and Dad ended up going back to the Yankee store and buying some brown and white seat covers for the front seat. The brown bomber looked great. Not almost new, but not almost 15 years old either. We brought Mama out and showed it to her, and she gave us one of those big hand-over-her-smile, smile, smile, hand-over-her-mouth smiles. Well, folks, Dad said, and we all knew what he was getting ready, that he was getting ready to cut up. All it needs now is that final touch, that special something that sets it apart from all the other buckets of bolts on the road. That one piece of all-American engineering that shows that this fine automobile is worthy of the name Brown Bomber. Any guesses what that thing is? A new hood thing? I asked. The thing in the middle of the hood was a long chrome rocket that pointed out over the road. The only thing that was wrong with it was that one of the wings of the rocket was broken off. Like with everything else, Dad had a crazy explanation for that. He told us that right after he got the car from Uncle Bud, both wings were there, but then he had taken it to a special garage, and they had one wing scientifically and mathematically cut off. When we asked him why, he told us that that, that when they came back from a long trip, we'd be coming in on a wing and a prayer. That's the kind of junk Dad thinks is funny. No, Dad answered my question. It's not a new hood thing. The one on there is perfectly fine. Joey, what's your guess? I don't know, Daddy. I don't think anything can make make the bomber any better. I think it's perfect. Bless you, sweetheart. Rufus, your turn. What do you think? I don't know, Mr. Watson. I like y'all's car just fine. 
I knew there was something I liked about that boy. All right, Walona, what's your guess? I don't know either, Mama said and rolled her eyes. I think the car is purr, purr, purr. Mom was cutting up, too. Oh, my God, I can't say it. Real cute, Walona. Well, since Kenneth and Mama have insulted the great brown one, I guess that leaves it up to Rufus and Pumpkin to put the final piece on. Dad handed the keys to Rufus. Rufus, you open the trunk. And Pumpkin, there's a small bag in there. You have the honor of putting inside uh, what's inside of it on. Rufus popped the trunk open and Joey took a small paper bag out. She turned her back to everyone and looked inside. Oh, Daddy, I love it! Do you know where it goes? Yes, Daddy. Okay, time's a-wasting. Put it on. She put her hand in the bag and, without pulling it out, said, And now, the thing that makes this car more perfect. Dad started helping Joey cut up. He said, The final touch. Joey repeated, The final touch. The height of technology. The height of technology. The ultimate in American knowledge. The ultimate in American knowledge. Mama couldn't take it anymore. For God's sakes, Daniel, what is it? It's the pinnacle of Western civilization. It's the pinnacle of Western civilization. Now, Joey, dazzle him, girl. Joey pulled her hand out of the bag and said, It's a smelly green pine tree. Mama went, Ugh and walked back into the house. Joey hung the smelly green pine tree from the rearview mirror and scooted out of the car to let me and Rufus smell her fingers. But Dad wasn't through adding things to the brown bomber. On Saturday morning, Joey and me got up real early to watch cartoons, and Dad was already brushing his teeth and shaving. I went into the bathroom to watch him. I love the way that, show, that shaving soap smells. Hi, Dad. Morning, Kenny. How'd you sleep? Dad said this with a toothbrush in his mouth. Okay, I guess. Then Dad pulled one of his famous tricks on me. He said, Kenny, look, and pointed out to the hallway. Even before I could think, think, my head turned around and I followed Dad's finger. When I saw nothing and looked back, Dad was smiling a mile a minute like he hadn't done anything. But I noticed his toothbrush was gone. I let him know that he didn't fool me. Dad, how come you always hide your toothbrush? Why don't you just keep yours with ours? Dad laughed. Well, Kenny, I guess I don't keep my toothbrush with the rest of yours because unlike your mother, I was a little boy once myself. I thought about this for a second and then said, What does that mean? Dad picked up my toothbrush and said, Look at this. Not only is this an instrument perfect for brushing teeth, it also has other wonderful uses too. You see, Kenny, I know that in a little boy's eyes, there isn't anything in the world that is better for general cleaning than a toothbrush. And the greatest thing about it is that with a good rinse afterward, no one can tell what it was used for. I also know that the best toothbrush for cleaning stuff is always someone else's. So, rather than wondering what my toothbrush cleaned last, I think it's better that it only goes places that I know about. Dad was right. I caught Byron using mine once to shine up some quarters, and another time to brush Blackie's teeth. I didn't really care, but Blackie didn't like it. That was the only time he ever growled at someone in his own family. Dad was stirring the soap dish up with his shaving brush, and I got close to the sink to smell the soap. Dad painted his face with the soap, then bent down and rinsed it off. I know it sounds crazy, but he always did this twice. He said it really made your beard super soft. He learned that because he used to work in a barber shop when he was a little boy. That's where he had also learned that if you go to the barber shop, you've got to make sure your neck is real clean. Otherwise, the barber talks about you like a dog after you leave. So, Dad said as he put the second coat of soap on his face, let me guess why you're standing so close. Could it be that you want me to soap your face up and hold you up here while you shave it off? It's been a long time since we've done that. Aw, oh, man, I'm too old for that. Besides, I'm starting to get a real mustache, Dad, look! I stuck my upper lip out for Dad to see. Where? Dad leaned down, looking real hard. I can't see it. Here, look! Maybe if I got closer to the light. Dad bent and picked me up to the mirror. I automatically turned my head sideways when I saw my reflection. Some of the time, I forgot about my lazy eye. 
Well, I don't believe it. If you squint your eyes and look real hard, there's no doubt about it. This boy's got a real mustache going here. I didn't know if Dad really could see it or not, but I knew it was there. He put me down. Won't be long before you and I have to share the mirror in the morning, huh? I couldn't help it. Even though I knew he might be kidding, I broke out in a real big smile and nodded my head up and down. Dad started shaving. Well, just so there's no problems, I've got seniority on you, so I get the bathroom first. Deal? When Dad finished, he asked, You too old for a little Old Spice? He slapped the cologne on me and said, Don't want your mother to know I put this aftershave on you. What, with you smelling so good and this new mustache coming out? I don't want her blaming me when all these little girls start attacking you. I twisted my face up. We walked into the living room to watch cartoons, but when we got there, Dad kept going and said, If your mother gets up before I'm back, just tell her I won't be long. Where are you going, Daddy? Joey asked. Dad gave his famous answer, Out, and closed the door behind him. Dad missed Felix the Cat, Soupy Sales, Beanie and Cecil, The Ray Dean Show, and Betty Boop. He missed Mama getting up and Byron getting up. When he finally got back, we were all sitting on the couch watching the worst cartoon ever made, Clutch Cargo. Dad walked in and turned the TV off. Dad! Sorry, kids. Everybody's going to come outside right now. You too, Daddy-o. And you too, Walona. I've got a surprise. Dad made a stop at the front door and get in a line, one behind the other. Mama first, then Byron, then me, then Joey. Except for bald headed by, we were all laughing and wondering what Dad's surprise was when he opened the door. Following Dad, we walked down the front porch steps and stood on the sidewalk like a little parade. I bet the neighbors wondered what the weird Watsons were doing this time. All right, Dad said. When I say it, I want everybody to close their eyes, and I'm warning you. Anyone who looks before I tell, it, tell you to is going to get it. My eyes, of course, would be sealed. If a bomb exploded under me, I'd be standing in the hole with my eyes sealed. Even if my head got blown off, they'd have to say, Here's that kid's head, and yup, his eyes are locked tight and safe. Byron said I was stupid for listening to everything that Mama and Dad said, but if I was so stupid, why was he the one with a great big, bald, shiny, knotted-up head? Dad said, Okay, now, hold the person in front of you by the shoulders. Wilona? You hold on to mine. This is only going to take a minute. He said the last part because Mama rolled her eyes and, said, and was real close to stopping everything by turning around and going back into the house. All right, close them. Mama gave him her last straw look and closed her eyes. Then so did we. Dad shuffled us ahead a little bit. Then we all stopped. It was real hard not to peek. Okay, keep them shut. I'm not playing. I heard a car door open, heard a loud pop, then heard Byron say, Aw, man! Me and Joey cracked up. We knew a certain person had peeked and got popped right smack jab on the bald head. Finally, Dad said, That's it. Open your eyes. What do you think? Dad opened the driver's side of the brown bomber and was standing with one arm pointing the way inside. In the middle of the dashboard, to the right of the steering wheel, was something real big sticking out. Dad had taken one of our giant towels and set it over the thing. Everybody stood there, staring. Finally, Mama said, Daniel, what on earth is that towel doing in there? The towel is fine, Walona. Aren't you wondering what's underneath it? Yeah, Dad. What is the thing? I asked. Well, Kenneth, since you seem to be the only one with any curiosity, I guess you'll be the one who gets to unveil the bomber's latest addition. I crawled into the front seat and raised a corner of the towel so no one but me could see what was under it. I couldn't believe it. Dad, it's great! The rest of them, Byron included, crowded up to the brown bomber's door. Mama had a worried voice. What have you done to this car now? Daniel, what's under that towel? I grabbed a corner of the towel. Ladies and gentle, Byron interrupted me when he saw I was going to tease them. He said, oh man, just pull the blind towel off so I can get out of here. I ain't got all day to listen to your mess. 
He was always in a hurry to get out of some place, but never had anywhere else to go. Byron, how many times have I told you about saying ain't? And Kenneth, you stop playing and move that towel this minute, Mama said. I talked real fast before Mama could get any madder. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest addition to the Brown Bomber. I whipped the, round the, whipped the towel aside, our very own drive-around record player. Mama went, oh my god, and gave Dad a dirty look, then walked back into the house. Joey squealed, oh boy! Even cool old Byron forgot how cool he was and screamed out, oh man, this is too, too hip! No one's got one of these. Speedy don't even have one in his Cadillac. Too much, man. Way too much. Joey and Byron climbed into the car on either side of me. We all said, Turn it on, Daddy! I knew Dad was kind of disappointed by the way Mama had acted. She really hurt his feelings by walking off like that. Some of the time, I think she forgot how sensitive Dad was. Even though he acted cheery with us, I knew it wasn't the same for him now. I knew if Mama had stayed and hadn't gone off mumbling about money, we would have been having a lot more fun. But Dad forgot all this stuff real quick and got excited about showing off the record player. Dad was like me. He loved putting on a show. Or as Mama said, we both loved acting the fool. Dad was the best at it, though, and I couldn't wait until I was as good as he was. Well, 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 Dad said, leaning down to the car. I see you three have the ultimate, have the ultimate in taste. I see you've chosen the top of the line, the cream of the crop, the True Tone AB700 model. The Ultra Glide. We had two, because right on the front of the record player in big red letters it said TTAB700 Ultra Glide. As I'm certain you are aware, the problem in the past with this new technology and automotive sound has been road vibrations interfering with an accurate dispersal of the phonic interpretations. Huh? Byron said. Dad said, in other words, I'm sure you know that in the good old days, every time you drove over a bump with one of those things, the needle would jump and scratch the record. Me and Joey played along. We know! We know! And, I'm as, and as I'm sure of such a fine, intelligent-looking family as this one, it is Mr. and Mrs. Watson and your son, isn't it? Oh no, jo Joetta said and pointed at Byron. This isn't our son. This is just a little juvenile delinquent boy that we feel sorry for and let follow us around some of the time. Our real son has hair. Even this didn't bother Byron, who was amazed by the Brown Bomber's latest edition. Dad kept imitating the guy who sold him the record player. Yes, I'm sure a nice family like this one is aware. It was only last year that the scientists' autotronic industries made a brilliant, beautiful, breathtaking breakthrough and developed a suitable system for controlling these vibrations. Yeah, I said. I saw it last night on the news. Walter Cronkite said it was a miracle. Dad laughed. Precisely, Mr. Watson. Walt has two of these babies in his car and one on his motorcycle. We know! We know! Yes, the vibration problem has been overcome by the exclusive vibrodynamic lateral anti-inertial dampening system. Dad had memorized that word because right on the arm of the record player it said VDLAI. Dampening. Patent. Come on, Daddy, turn it on. Stop teasing. Now, now, Mrs. Watson, be patient and tell that little delinquent that follows you around that if he touches one more knob on that record player, I'm going to pull his fingers off. Byron mumbled and sat back in the seat. Before I dazzle you with the symphonic sound of this unit, let me point out some of its less appreciated features. Oh, please do. Oh, man, just turn the blank thing on. If I gotta listen to all this jive, I'm going to go in the house and get some real cool sound. Byron opened the passenger door and ran into the house. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Watson, I'd like to direct your attention to the rear of your classic automobile. Me and Joey crawled up onto the back seat and looked at the back window. On the rear shelf, a hole had been cut and was covered with the same stuff that's on a screen door. I can see that you're wondering what that is. Well, let me explain. What we have here is, believe it or not, a second speaker. And I could tell that by the intelligent look on your face, Mrs. Watson, that you have grasped that speaker is not placed in the rear deck haphazardly. No, ma'am. Some people think we have just a whole hack back there by any old mechanic, but nothing could be farther from the truth. 
That opening is scientifically and mathematically positioned by a factory trained technician to enhance the TTAB-700's true high fidelity sound. Wow! Byron exploded through the front door with an armful of 45s and Mama right on his tail. Byron Watson, don't you stomp on those stairs like that and don't you dare slam that screen door! She trailed Byron all the way to the car, fussing at him the whole way. I knew she was using Byron as an excuse to come back out and see what was going on. I guess all the laughing and fun we were having made her want to join in. Now that she was back, Dad started really cutting up. Well, 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 Mrs. Watson, Dad said, but not to Mom, but to Joey. I see your beautiful young daughter has decided to join us, and not a moment too soon. Why don't you scoot over a bit and let her in? Joey loved this chance to pretend that she was Mama's mom. She patted the seat next to her and said, Come on in, honey. This is really cool. Mama slid in under the steering wheel with halfway smile on her face. Wonderful, wonderful, Dad said. Byron lifted the record that was already on the turntable and started putting one of his own cool songs on. Put it back, son. Go we'll get your turn. First, we have a special request from a certain young lady to a certain handsome young man. If you'll excuse me, ma'am, I'll just reach over here and get this show on the road. Dad reached over past Mama to start the car, but on the way, his hand kind of accidentally, on purpose, brushed her chests. Boy, did they think we were blind. Even though Dad thought he was being slick, everybody saw this. Mama puckered up her lips to squeeze down a smile and crossed her arms over her chest. Joetta giggled, and me and Byron scrunched up our faces. Mama did a fakety little slap at his hand and smiled. Dad turned the key, and the brown bomber fired up. Okay, young lady, here's that special number you requested. Dad couldn't help himself and started imitating a disc jockey. Here's the man with the patter, here to spin the platter. Why, it doesn't matter, because the world's getting fatter. I'm the man with the tune that'll take you to the moon, that'll make your poor heart spoon. I'll hold you like a spoon, I'm the man with the jive. Byron chirped up. Ain't that the whole natural truth? But Dad didn't miss a beat. Put your love thing in drive, put your little world alive. Mama slapped the car seat. Daniel, start that record. All right, all right. Dad stopped his rhyming, not because Mama told him to, but because he ran out of stupid poems. But first, let me tell you, tell all you people out there in Radio Land that this number was requested by a Miss Wilona Sands for the wonderful, wonderful man in her life, the Big Daddy of Love, Daniel Watson. We at Flint's only soul station, WAMM, dedicate this song to Daniel and Wilona. Spin it, maestro! Dad reached over past Mama to start the record player. Joey grabbed my arm with one hand and squealed into her other one. Byron was grinning like a giant, bald-headed, kindergarten baby. Mama still had her arms crossed but was starting to smile. She brought one hand up to cover her mouth. My foot was tapping on the brown bomber's floor a mile a minute. I couldn't make it stop no matter what I did. I guess I was grinning pretty hard, too. Dad's hand touched a knob that had start written on it. But before he turned it, he pulled his hand back and said, First, however, we all screamed, Daddy! Aw, oh, man, come on, Dad! Daniel! But Dad wasn't finished yet, and you couldn't rush him. In fact, the more you'd complain, the longer he'd take. He put his hand up to stop the noise, but first, we at WAMM want to apologize to the nine other women who called in requesting love songs to be dedicated to Daniel Watson. If they stay tuned, we'll play their songs later in the evening. Mama said, that's it, and started climbing out of the car. It was fun. That's it, though. Not a serious one. Dad blocked the door, and finally, finally turned the knob that said start. Then he got into the back seat. We all froze. Even the brown bomber seemed to get quieter as the VDLAI arm from the record player lifted itself and moved toward the 45 that was on the turntable. The arm dropped, and a hollow little boom bounced around the car. A moment of silence, and then... And then the most beautiful notes of music I ever heard came from the front of the car and the back of the car at the same time. Doom-da-doom-doom, doom-da-doom-doom, doom-da-doom-doom-doom. Doom, 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 doom. 
The notes were so deep and the straw and strong it felt like they were sitting inside a giant bass fiddle. Mama screamed and with both her hands over her mouth she'd recognized her song after the first couple of notes. The guy on the record started singing under the boardwalk and I had to turn around and look because it sounded like he was right in the back seat with Dad. We sat in the car for almost two hours as everybody got a chance to go in the house and get their favorite records. Even though we had a pretty good record player in the house, it couldn't compare with the sounds that came from the scientifically and mathematically put in speakers that the Brown Bomber had. The Ultra Glide cast a spell on all the weird Watsons. Byron was, was always saying that Mama couldn't stand to see anyone having too much fun, but to be fair to her, I have to say that she stopped us from having fun in steps, instead of doing it all at once. First she thought the music was too loud and made us turn it down some. Then, after all us kids got to play four songs each, I played Yakety Yak all four times. She made us get out of the car and she and Dad played Nat King Cole and Dinah Washington and other mushball singers. Then she said to Dad, Did you tell them yet? Uh oh. I leaned into the car to get a look at Mama's stomach. This sounded like the way Byron and me found out we were going to get a sister. Everybody's ears jumped something big was going on. Dad wasn't too comfortable with things like this and said, No, it can wait. No, it can't. Mama let the last song finish and said, Turn it off, Daniel. Children, in a little bit, Daddy's going to get some vacation time, and we're going to drive to Alabama. Grandma Sands is going to be keeping Byron for the summer, and if things don't work out, he'll stay there for the next school year. This was too good to be true. A long trip in the Brown Bomber and no Byron for the whole summer? And probably for the whole year? Because when it came to Byron, nothing ever worked out. Byron looked at Mama and Dad with his mouth wide open. We've been telling you, Byron. You've been given, war given warning after warning and chance after chance to straighten up. But instead of improving, you're getting worse. Do I have to remind you of the things that you've done just this last year? Byron still didn't close his mouth. Mama started ticking off the things that Byron called his latest, uh, that Byron called his latest fantastic adventures. You've cut school so much that Mr. Alum has to come here three times to see what's wrong with you. You've been lighting fires. You've been taking change out of my purse. You've been in fights. You had that trouble up at Mitchell's food fair, and you had that problem with Marianne Hill. You set mouse traps in the backyard for birds. You fell out of a tree when you were trying to see if that poor cat would always land on its feet. You got that conk. You joined that gang. There's just too much, Byron. We can't have all this nonsense going on. I hope those weren't the last of the only fantastic. I hope those weren't the only latest fantastic adventures that Mama knew about. I could list at least a hundred more. That's why Grandma Sands is going to look after you for a while. You're about to run us crazy. Mama changed the tone of her voice. You're going to like Birmingham, Byron. It's a lot different than Flint. There are lots of nice boys your age down there who you could be friends with. There's lots of fishing and hunting that you can do. Things are a lot better there. I love that city. Your grandma tells me it's quiet in our old neighborhood. She says that the stuff on TV isn't happening around her. It's just like I remember it being. It's safe. It's quiet. And there's no buphead. Mama and Dad had threatened to send Byron to Grandma Sands about a million times, but never thought it would happen. This was four of the three good, three good reasons. The first reason was that Alabama was out two million miles from Flint, and Vi knew that Mama wouldn't let him ride a bus alone that far. He also knew that it would just about impossible for her to sit on a bus with him for three days it took to get there. The second reason was that Mama and Dad were always threatening to do stuff to Byron that everybody knew they wouldn't do. Dad had been keeping a countdown on how many more months it would be before they could force him to join the army, but we knew they wouldn't do that. But the biggest reason Byron and Joey thought they would never be able to send him to Alabama was because we heard so many stories about how strict Grandma Sands was. The thought of living with her was so terrible that your brain would throw it out as soon as it came in. Well, Byron's brain had better get used to it. We all knew by the way they'd gotten the brown bomber ready and by the way Mama's voice sounded that they meant it this time. The big, cool baby finally shut his mouth and ran into the house. 
he heard he slammed the door as hard as he could, and we all heard him say real clear the S word. Joey said, Ooh. Dad started to go in after him, but Mama said, Let him go, Daniel. You better get as much of that nonsense out of the system all I can. Grandma Sands will be putting up with any of that mess. Yeah. I don't think Byron's going to like going out to Alabama either. But that chapter is done, and we have to say goodbye for now. But we'll be back tomorrow for another episode of Let's Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiaya and Daniel. Stay safe, stay healthy, and Watson Wednesday will continue next week with Chapter 9. The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. Remember, reading is power.